You know, it's not all about, hey, uh, the earth is going to get crushed, da, da, da. You know, being prepared, it means being prepared for anything, whether it be a tornado, a flood, or even the passing of a brown dwarf star. It doesn't matter what it is, you should be prepared because I guarantee you there's a lot of people who listen to this show that live in the path of that storm that are thinking, wow, you know, and I laugh at these guys. But, hey, everyone, I've read off the bio, and he is here with us now. So, everybody, please welcome back to Late Night in the Midlands, my good friend, Dr. Rand. Hello, Dr. Rand. Good good evening, my dear friend, and, and good evening to your dear listeners. It is with a very, very heavy heart that I called you the other day and said that, you know, I'd like to come on and express a few thoughts with everyone. Mm -hmm. And I am overwhelmed by the disaster. It's far worse than even you and I had talked about in my last appearance on your show. Do you remember? Yes, sir, I do. We spoke about the Northeast. And I, I said something to the effect that but by the grace of God, will be spared a major storm that makes a turn up to the northeast. It was toward the end of that second show. That's right. That was just predicated upon watching the patterns, going back against old records, and trying to chart these things. Now, it's it's not rocket science, but by the same token you have to take it very seriously because that's what I do. I write books. <laughs> I'm talking to sometimes millions of people through through one show. It gets radiated outward. It's like your show is like has ripples. You see, see. Mm-hmm. Let's let's take a second and just deviate from all the horror and tragedy and unfulfilled lives that has just happened in our great nation, because we are at the verge. What is it now, four days, three and a half to four days before this country fulfills its destiny one way or the other, okay? As you know, Michael, I really don't go political. You know, Mm -hmm. but there's the middle path, and you know, it's, nothing to do with where you are on the, on, the, on, the, on the political calendar or on the political scale. There's a right and a wrong reality system that any normal, conscious, spiritually oriented human being would feel as their compass point. So I find it very hard to believe that what just happened in the Northeast was not a manifestation of all of the power that the planet brought to bear on itself. See, the planet didn't plan to hurt the Northeast. The weather patterns didn't deliberately target the Caribbean and then to bend up along the coast and slam into the northeast. And then that other storm. None of it's pre-planned. There's no power game here. What's happening on the earth to this planet at this time is way beyond the normal understanding and persuasion of someone who, you know, is supposed to know the difference between believing in extraterrestrials and what has that got to do with 2012 and all this other Mayan calendar stuff and it's like this huge onion begins to peel itself down and as this huge beautiful onion goes layer by layer which is which is what basically has been happening to earth since about you know the story starts back in 19 about 1980 one, when the government 
with great foresight and with great talent, launched a series of infrared telescopes <clears throat> uh, via satellite. And these telescopes would function absolutely perfectly and be able to photograph and synthesize things that were in the in the um, ultraviolet range, the hard, the hard to detect where you'd have to have special filters because of mm -hmm. low, low density from the object. See, what we're talking about is that they discovered in 1983, after they deployed, it was called the IRAS uh, telescopic system. And around 1982, <clears throat> they first detected what they thought was an errant comet system, but it wasn't, a, in fact, a comet. It was one uniquely singular asteroid-like appearance of an object, but it was strangely round. It had, it had mass, it had substance, and it was large. The Iris Telescope, with its infrared capacities, detected what they believed to be an incoming celestial object headed, theoretically, telemetry-wise, right into the path of our solar system. In other words, they didn't know if it was going to collide with it. They didn't know if it was just going to pass it by. Whatever it was, was headed directly toward our star and our solar system. Mm -hmm. And they made an announcement a big splash, actually. <clears throat> it was in uh, 1983. I think it was November. Press releases and and NASA on television and and faint images, telescopic images of a very strange object way out there. You could see it. It was kind of dark red. I remember the photos. And I've recreated all of this, of course, in our book, The Return of Planet X. This Planet X thing is not a planet. It is, in fact, a brown dwarf star, which we believe is the same object as named in Chapter 8 of the Book of Revelation. So the Book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible written by St. John the Divine, described this object in Chapter 8 with all of its ramifications and all, this, all of the specific elements which is exactly what has been happening to our planet. In other words, the prose and the story and the allegory and the lessons and the timing as depicted in chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. And then we go to chapter 8, verse 11, and that verse is, and I'm quoting, and the name of the star was Wormwood, W-O-R-M-W-O-O-D. Don't confuse it with the Chernobyl wormwood of the Russian version of this. This is, just take it for face value, okay? So they discovered this incoming object, and they made a big splash about it. And guess what they called it? Michael, they called it. I didn't do it. Michael. They called it Planet X. Now, how appropriate is that? See, I've been accused of creating this myth. I didn't create any myth. The story that they broke to the world for less than 24 hours, by the way, within, within less than 24 hours, after making a big splash in radio and television and, and all this stuff, the story was completely and instantly rubbed right out from the consciousness of the public. It was just unbelievably successfully, it all disappeared. Until some rogue scientists and astronomers were getting together and forming what appeared to be some kind of a colleague of men who were studying this incoming object aside from the government, you see. In other words, there was a secondary component of astronomers and 
and mathematicians, and it was, and it did probably have some Russian involvement. So that was a natural threat to the United States, one way or the other. Not a right or wrong thing; it's reality, right? If I may, Doctor Rand, uh, I believe Russia has actually done reports on this. I've seen some oh, yeah. uh, videos. No, oh, so yeah. they don't uh, they don't keep no, it no big secret there. No, the Russians the Russians are about twenty years ahead of us. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry, NASA. You guys were asleep at <laughs> the switch. <laughs> anyway, 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 this is this isn't about bashing NASA or or misunderstanding the reality of what we're discussing. Okay, the truth about Planet X has been out there for a long, long time. And over the past, oh, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years, now we're going to go into something very shocking. <clears throat> There's been a very strange and very mysterious and very sinister fact that many of these rogue astrophysicists and Astronomers are being systematically murdered, run over by trucks, burned up in a car accident, hit by a truck, falls from a balcony, smothers himself in his pillow. I mean, this kind of nonsense. Well, one of my spies out there sent me another terrible report of another mm. astrophysical professor. He was an astronomer and he was murdered in Chile. He was uh, Japanese. I'm going to read from this, but mm. I just want to set the stage here. I'm not making any of this up. I don't have to make any of it up. It's so fascinating that it would make a TV series, which actually, Michael, I've already got developed into a, isn't that an interesting thing? I've already finished a complete uh, screenplay to launch a new sci-fi element to teach the truth. It's real simple. Just call it Planet X. Everybody likes Planet X. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to read, it's under date of 10-30-2012, so that's October 30th, just two, three, four days ago of this year, 2012, 10-30-2012. Um, it's authored by a, a well-respected um, Planet X theorist and reporter, and videographer John DiNardo. He has his own website, which we can give out if you like. John writes commentary. Oh. And, and when he discovered this, he thought it was important. He wrote it up. In other words, he wrote it up as, as like a press release, you see, of what he had discovered. Another astronomer, a very valued astronomer, has been mysteriously murdered. And I said, uh-oh. Now I'm, I'm really getting worried because I think that they're about to announce that we can now see it in the Southern Hemisphere coming out from behind the sun. I think that it's going to be visible soon. Now, I don't know how many more they have left to kill, but I can tell you that this movement is far from silent. Do you follow me, Michael? Oh, yeah. In other words, they're just not letting this happen. Okay. I um, have to take a second here. I have I have a darling, beautiful, white, rescued cat, which is only about a year old. She's, she's my little princess, and she's decided that she... Come on, sweetheart. Come on, little girl. I call her little girl because she's kind of petite. My little girl, I have to work now. She says, "Yeah, but you know, <laughs> I want to. I want to know what you're talking about, you know." Okay, so she wandered off. She's off to my side here. 
it's my little princess. Um, back to this press release in all seriousness, on the date of 10 2012. Here's how John starts it out. He 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 starts it out as if it's a a um, government paper. Part one starts out the title. Part one. Why are they murdering astronomers? Question mark. Then comes the subtitle. Astrophysicist Professor Kawai Ichiru Morita, paren, astronomer murdered in Chile, paren. Part one. They are murdering all these astronomers. I'm, I'm reading directly from the copy, everybody. All mutual strangers and far apart. In other words, they were all mutual strangers. They were all working separate things, and they were all far apart, but having one particular talent in common. Each one of these murdered astronomer, astronomers were capable of heralding a massive celestial body whose gravitational pull once caused punctual periodic disturbances to the solar system. All right. In this case, these guys were studying what they thought were these comets. Continuing, it says, you see comets are periodic, punctual. This massive cometary, cometary dwarf star orbits in passing Earth once every, once every 36 and one-half centuries. That's like you know, pretty much like 36, 3,600 years, just like we were talking yeah. about. Now, stepping back from the text, my own comment. Well, guess what, guys, kids, mom and dads, and anybody else who's listening? What this actually boils down to is that as a reality system, our planet and our solar system, by the way, our solar system is about ready to pass on or around December 21st, 2012. Again, something strange. Our whole solar system will have crossed over a, a theoretical line in deep space, whereby yeah. it's going to be <clears throat> repositioning itself opposite the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which... We only come around, they say, every 68,000 years. In other words, once every 68,000 years, our solar system, in all its majesty, once again completes its circuit around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, like everything else does. And it all, an we're all traveling, time to be we're here. all moving <laughs> in a counterclockwise arcing kind of movement. If you were to look at it, you know, face down on a board, everything is rotating counterclockwise. And that's extremely important. Now, on the cosmic clock, the one that the Mayans and all the ancients and all the cave depictions, everything depicted an ending time and a certain date, and it was so overwhelming that most people just didn't even bother to think about it. Most all of these predictors, it's even in the Great Pyramid, had all predicted on or about December 21st, 2012. Now, why is that? That is a little too strange and a little too spooky to just say, oh, well, that's just circumstance. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, if it, if it, if it, flies like a deer, and if it's as beautiful as a deer, and if it flies like a deer, it must be a deer. Well, what's going on is that it's beyond human comprehension. There's a celestial alignment going on involving our solar system and the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which changes frequencies. We will probably pass from a positive to a negative. Doesn't mean from a good to a bad, no forget it's just a different <laughs> electromagnetic charge that we interact with because of 
how our planet's constructed and how our solar system works. Our Would that change system, our magnetic pole? It, it could change dozens of dynamics, including electromagnetics and mass and time shifting and all kinds of things. We don't know. <laughs> we're, basically, we're no more than about, about 25,000 years old in terms in terms of of legacy so we're not we haven't yet experienced what we could be about to be experiencing and i liken it to something that that could be really really nasty or it won't be bad at all maybe we're seeing the worst of it right now as we didn't we say that didn't we say that in our last show i said that hopefully michael and we kind of all prayed on it i said hopefully you know, we only had, what was it? We had another two months. I said we only had 60 days left in the in the hurricane cycle, which ends November 30th. And I said, and you said, and we all agreed, well, by the grace of God, we'll get by that, and we won't have any kind of an event that threatens the Northeast. Now. Well, we did. We did. Now. You talked earlier about preparation, and and we keep talking about that. All the time we talk about it. It's what the book is all about. We're talking about uh, a book we've had out now since uh, 2007. Uh, we're in our third printing. I have got some books left. I'm going to keep selling them until they're gone. Um, we talk about all of this. And what's important is Chapter 7 of our book, which is which is called um, Order Out of Chaos, where we talk, talk, take you through everything that's going on with the government. See, I had a, I had to prefigure all this almost six years before the events happened, because they've all happened as we've cited in the book. But what I had to do is I had to project myself somehow into the future to see how all these things worked out. And as you know. The book is. You will be great very accurate, and a great Dr. storyteller. Ray. Pardon? Yeah, well, it's more than just a story, my friend, because uh, you told me about four, a little over four years ago, hmm. that uh, this type of change was coming: earthquakes, volcanoes, and uh, you know. And I know a lot of people made light of it, and I don't think too many are anymore. Um, I no, I'm. So. I, get, I hope not. I get. I used to get, you know, kind of weird looks and smirks when people recognize, recognize me. Now it's becoming much more respectful. I'm not a well-known celebrity. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But there are people who have seen me on video and TV, sometimes in and out of an airport. And I've been on, like, four or 500 radio and TV shows. So the point is I think I know the subject. I've researched it. it took me almost eight years of writing and research to produce the book which we published in March of 2007. So I had, all this has been on the burner 10, 12 years. And I have to write, I'm writing about the future. The future is now. That's what the book is all about. So we'll take you through it. But the key element throughout the book is be prepared. Take a second look at your security and, you know, do you have any provisions? You know, we're not, we're not talking about, you know, wild mountain men type things, you know, not malicious. <laughs> just, just you and your family. Look what just happened. And many of them were prepared. That's the point. Many of those people were probably well prepared, but it was overwhelming, you see. 30 feet of water, three stories, a surge. No, that's very difficult to deal with. The point that I always try to leave with someone who we're speaking with is that it may not affect you this moment in time or next week or the week after or the month after that. But who knows? It could be a tornado. Could be an earthquake. Could be a windstorm. Could be a firestorm. Could be a volcanic eruption. I can go on and on. Yeah, but you're scaring me, man. Don't don't do that, man. 
Well, yeah. you're seeing it. I'm not forecasting it. You can see it, smell it, feel it, and touch it. Just go there and try to help. I mean, if you really want to do something, volunteer your time. If if you have the luxury of doing it, and go there. If you were an electrician, you know what I'm saying. If you had a skill, if you were an expert plumber or firefighter, or you know, on vacation, whatever, whatever, what, and you want to do something, now is the time to go. You go at the worst time. You see. So I, t I totally yeah. understand what everybody's up against. Now, for those that narrowly escaped, believe me, l let's say a block away you were okay, you follow me, and the, you know, the flood ended on J Street, right? And you were up at M Street, okay? You're thinking about all of this, and you're watching it, and you're saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, God. You know, you spared me. And then there are those who obviously have lost everything. Everything. Yeah. The house, they can't even find the house, blew out the sea, or something as tragic as that. All right. I, didn't, I did not want this show tonight to be all doom and gloom. This is not doom and gloom. This is Reality 101 on today's date. Nothing I've said is untrue. I have not exaggerated anything. I haven't made anything up. I'm just discussing reality as awful as it is. So, I decided, I decided that maybe what we should talk about tonight is what it would take for a family of five. It, it, was that about a good figure? Would you say most families are three kids? A mom, mom and dad, three kids, a dog, and two cats. Is that about yeah. close? That's about close. And it's probably but two let, girls and one. It's probably two girls and one boy. Okay. Let's uh, hold on to your thought right there, Doctor Rand. We've we've got to take a break, my friend. So it wasn't know what's going on. They know very well what's going on. They've got their underground bases and all that good stuff. And a lot of speculation goes into much of this. But uh, um, yeah, I'm not that naive. Maybe they don't know the seriousness of it. Maybe those underground bunkers are precautionary. I don't know, but uh, they definitely know what's going on. I mean. They sent the satellites up. They named it. Dr. Rand is my guest. His book is The Return of Planet X. And I'll tell you, he is uh, one of the best in this field. He really is. Uh, uh, we've had quite a few guests down here um, about this subject. And uh, I say, you know, whether you believe that some brown dwarf star is out there or not, you should still be prepared. So there's a lesson in this no matter what you believe. You can't deny the facts. The facts is, is that the earthquakes have increased. The storms have uh, become super. Frankenstorms are calling. I mean, come on. Uh, when you get a name like Frankenstorm, um, that's some serious stuff. So uh, you can't deny the facts that things are happening, and they're happening at a very fast pace and people should be prepared for it. And uh, so we're going to get back to it here with Dr. Rand. Uh, Dr. Rand, we left off with mom, dad, three kids, and maybe the dog and cat. And we'll even throw well, a fish in there just for the heck of it. Uh, yeah, a little, a little <laughs> orange fish in a little round bowl. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> where does this theoretical family live? It could be anywhere USA. How's that? Okay, just okay. pick whatever spot your imagination. You know, if you know if you like Virginia, your family's from Virginia. You follow me? You pick your you pick your locale. It's your family. Okay, it's called mm -hmm. it's called let's pretend, but let's see what we discover about ourselves. Okay, so you're the father, mother, three children, a couple of pets. And you you live in an okay house. You pretty much understand who you are. You know what your responsibility are as a father and a husband, and you know part of the fabric of the 
community you live in, you know, all the all the normal stuff. Okay. So, what would you do theoretically if you went to bed one night and about midnight a tornado came and tore the whole top of your house off? Fortunately, nobody was living, I mean, nobody was sleeping upstairs at the time. Would you be prepared, although your family's life was saved, and the dogs and the cats, I mean, everybody survived, but your house is almost a total wreck. No. Well, I wouldn't would be you... prepared myself. <laughs> Not that Pardon? prepared. I'm sorry, I said I, I wouldn't be prepared myself. Uh, you know, I'm I'm honest with people, and you know, I don't prepare as well as I should. And I think that's the case with most people. Well, let's say he lost the you know the second half, the top of his house, and tore off the second story. Everything below that survived within reason. You know, lots of twisted stuff, but it all survived downstairs. So with that as a start. How would you survive for the next 30 days, just 30 days? No power, probably no water, which means no light unless you have lots and lots and lots of those big, fat candles that take 12 hours to wear down. Because without those candles... One in every room, you are living in the dark. Crystals not being, TLC. Not being <laughs> melodramatic, everybody. Just think about it. Just think about it. And I do speak from experience because I went through the Studio City and Northridge earthquake of, nine, of January 17th, 1994, that struck the valley of which I was a resident in a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous apartment with a pool. Walk out and dive in the pool. Anyway, almost lost my life. Pretty much tore the building to shreds. We repaired it. it took one and a half years to repair the building to code standards before we could move back in to my beautiful apartment. Now, I saved all my furniture and everything there, but there was still I had broken pictures and stuff. And I mean, I didn't get wiped out. You see, I was prepared. Oh, was I prepared. I had a little storage locker in one of these mini storage, and I had food, and I had water, and I had gas cans. I fared out pretty good, except at the hood of my beautiful 1979 Cadillac Eldorado, the storage bin above where I parked my car collapsed. And oh. That. oh, is it? Yeah, and the car was already an antique, seventy-nine. Mm -hmm. Anyway, cost about twenty-eight hundred dollars to repair it, which my insurance did months later. Other than that, I survived with all of my stuff. Even my computer stuff survived. Anyway, I decided that based on that experience, I had to finish the book. I mean, I had started it, and had talked about it, but I and and strange thing is that I really don't talk about it in the book. I thought, no, that's too personal. So, let's start with a house that's partly damaged. Let's say you lose a second story. Do you have food supplies for five people for thirty days? And you have to remember. You really you can't keep meat anymore. So it has to be pretty much meatless. See how suddenly complicated? You can't have meats because you can't keep them cold unless you had those little ice. You know, you could buy ice, I suppose. Yeah, you could. Okay, yeah, all right, be creative. All right. Why should I limit anybody? It's still very painful. What about water? Really, they suggest at least a minimum of one gallon per day per person. That's a minimum. 
Some people need two gallons of water per day, drinking or whatever. Forget about bathing. I, I had to go to friends' places to take showers because there was no water, you see. Now, you need pet food. Do you have sand for your cats or you can't let them go out? Because if they're found, if your pets were found roaming, they were taken by the city, and you had 30 days to bail them out if they survived. You see, so you need food and enough extra water for your pets. If you have dogs, you need double the water that you need for cats. You see how complicated? And we aren't even we aren't even talking about the kids yet. You see? <laughs> Does this all sound silly and stupid? I hope not. Because Not to people on the East Coast. Not to people on the East Coast, no. And once again, I am so sensitive and I hurt for that. I can't, we kind of foresaw it, but anyway. The next thing you need to worry about or base other basic things. How about medicine? How about how about a couple of bandages, some gauze, some cream, some Vaseline? Just you know, what you need to do is you need to make up a emergency medicine kit. You want to put it in a suitcase? Put it in a suitcase. Who cares? You follow me? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a good idea. Put it in a real sturdy suitcase. Put together so that you can lock it. And grab it, and off you go. If something bad's coming, like that flood, or you know, let's say you were down in the, you're up in the northeast. I'm down. I'm in the uh, northwest corner of the state of Mississippi, where it borders Tennessee. Um, those people had had, in some cases, some warning. But I don't think the ones that decided to stay really understood the severity and the danger that they faced. Mother Nature, she what? She takes no quarter, and she gives no quarter, you see? She's unpredictable, and she's very, very powerful. And we... Can't do much about it, except prepare. That's right. We can't steer it. We shouldn't be trying to. You know, there's a whole bunch of conspiracies. You hear, did you hear all the latest stuff on the net? By the way, all that stuff you hear on the net, some of it's true. A lot of it isn't. Harp. You're talking about harp, I, I take it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to, Yeah. Let's hope that this wasn't something deliberately planned because if it was oh boy somebody you will know, pay for I've that had, I've had some Dr. Rand tell me that uh, harp can do everything from earthquakes to create storms and then I've had some pretty uh, smart people tell me that yes it could steer a storm and, and maybe uh, that type of thing but they don't they think it gets too much credit yeah, well, I hope it's not true. But then again, no, I hope not either. But then again, whoever heard of Hangar 18, right? <laughs> or or Roswell, or some of these other famous little stories. Some night, I don't want to deviate from tonight's, but some night, I want to share with you my living experiences with George Van Tassel in a place called. Giant rock on the middle of the Mojave Desert outside Landers, California. High Mojave Desert, about I don't know, 18 to 2,200 feet elevation. And clear skies at night. Anyway, it was the site of a machine. By the way, the story of it appears in my book. As a matter of fact, toward the end of my book, I do a two or three, four page spread about, about this place. Um, Everyone should visit it before they die because it's a very special 
metaphysical vortex of cosmic energies and vibrations that that enter and exit the earth at the exact spot of where George Van Tassel built this machine. We'll we'll talk about it in in another show, but it's in the book. Okay. So uh, you have your book, so you look look it up. Yes, I do. It's at the back of the book. Anyway, we'll have a special show on that. I think it'll be most enlightening. Now. What does that, it doesn't have anything to do with all of us? Yes, of course it does. Because I had the rare opportunity to discuss with George Van Tassel my experience that I had up in Canada. We talked about this on the show before when I was um, a, a boy of 11 who had the absolute honor and they say my life complex reality shift of spending just under five hours on board an extraterrestrial ship with benevolent intelligent very sensitive extraterrestrial entities they call themselves the fourth racers from the planet Epsilon in the Arcturus star system. They have a blue sun and an orange sun. And these people traverse time and they also pivot and change layers of reality. They don't travel through space. It's a di different... I'm not a physicist nor do I pretend to be. Not shape-shifting, although they do have cloaking and decloaking. They're everything that Gene Roddenberry ever envisioned for Star Trek. Anyway, the last hour that I was on the ship comprised... Me and my friend Elon, the extraterrestrial boy about my age. Well, in fact, we were both 11, but his 11 was like 24 Earth. He was mm -hmm. that advanced at age 11. And we sat in a, in a pie-shaped, looked like a small compact classroom. And you walk to the back of it so that you're looking from the narrow part is where the two chairs were. You're looking at what appeared to be like a 180-degree spread. Imagine when I finally saw a, a modern-day flat screen. I saw at least a half a dozen of those splayed, like 80-inch ones, you know, like you know, three feet high and 80 inches wide. There was this whole series of images and video and music, and it was like, whoa. So they had from, YouTube. From the past, to the, past <laughs> to the present to show me a little bit about what happened, how the solar system came together, and I got to see this whole thing with Wormwood. And thus the challenge was given me to pursue all the things I've done, culminating partly with writing this book. Because he gave me all the pieces where to find it. And it was the verse 11 of chapter 8 in the book of Revelation that cemented it. And the name of the star is Wormwood. That thing, it all fit together. Over, over 40 years of living and working and, and experiencing the metaphysical world. Now, mm -hmm. what's that got to do with tonight? It's got everything to do with tonight. Because everything that we talk about tonight is relevant to, to what either just happened 48 hours ago 
or in the moment now, tonight, or maybe 48 hours into the future. You see? Now, is time a component of what's happening to the planet as these storms get worse and worse? Well, I'd like to answer that one real real quick. Now I'm going to I'm going to let's let's hyper jump everybody. Let's hyper jump past the election into 20 into January 1st 2013. And then let's go another year to 14 and somewhere between 14 and 2015. I think okay. that's we got a change. call from uh, New York as well. Okay. We're ready to take a phone call. All right, let me yeah, just let me finish this point. Um okay. I'm not sure that just getting through December twenty first, twenty twelve means we're in or out of anything. It's just the midway point between the transitions. This thing has to now exit the entire solar system. And what affects our sun affects everything else in our solar system system because what affects the sun the sun affects and causes our changes so with that in mind I'm not sure that this agony is going to necessarily be over it might it might get better we'll get right to the caller it might get better but I'm not sure we're over all this hopefully we will be Hopefully, we'll get into the new year without any more storms, and we'll have to deal with whatever happens with the election, because I'd rather not have another serious event on top of the the election coming You're into January. Both. All right. And, yeah, there's a pretty large earthquake in uh, British Columbia, too, uh, just recently. I think, was that three days ago? It might have been, yeah. Two, three days ago. Well, I've been, I want to get to the caller, but I've been tracking the earthquakes. By the way, if any of you are interested in getting a daily briefing by the USGS, all you have to do is ring them up on the Internet and tell them that you'd like to have them send to your personal you know, email the latest updates on earthquakes. I chose ones that are that are between 4.5 up to up to 0.5 and above. In other words, I don't want to hear about the small ones, the ones, twos and threes, or you know maybe even the big fours. Mm -hmm. I get eight, nine a day. I'm tracking them. I have copies of every one of them. What an interesting book that would make. Now, why is all this important? Because it's happening underneath you, over you, around you, through you, and with you. So I'm not making any of it up. I don't want to scare anybody. Just look around with what just happened. It's reality. All right. I'm okay. <laughs> again, again right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone out there who is affected. If you're listening, I know you have the sympathy of myself and Michael and all of our listeners. Okay? All right. How about our caller? All right. Let's do it. we got a couple calls now uh, okay. that we'll get to. Uh, sure. First up, we have Michael in New York. Michael, you're on Late Night in the Midlands with Dr. Rand. Hello, Dr. Rand. Hello, Michael. Oh. Hi. Yes. Uh, where, Michael? Sir, where are you? I'm in Water Relief, New York. Uh, were you affected by the storm? No, actually, I did a, an informational prayer that kept my daughter in Boston clear of it, as well as myself in the Albany zone. Uh, so we made an effort that I announced on around 9.45 and the 29th on Facebook, calling uh -huh. for the holistic healers to ask their higher source, let's stop it in Jersey. Right. And you can see where it broke up thereafter. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the southern part of Manhattan did get caught in that area. Yes, but yes. You, you could see in the uh, 
photos that were being taken by by the uh, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, Satellite. The Earth. Satellite. Yes. You could see what looked like the, the ridge all the way down the east coast, and if you look closer, you would see the chemtrails between the storm and the mainland. You would also see the aerosol bombs and the uh, heart rays, and they were pushing the, the storm into the East Coast. When I wonder, were they trying to get Washington, or was there just the whole area in general uh, trying to get the two fronts to mix and cause havoc? Why, why, sir, why do you think they did this? What's the reason? Or who did it? Who did it? I, I personally didn't involve myself with who, in as much as that they were doing it. Uh -huh. And the other, the other part was that we were in the midst of what you would say a spiritual battle that involved not only the the extraterrestrials, uh, the the holistic healers, and as well as the other side, which is part of us as much as we are part of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what was important. I see. I understand exactly. I do totally understand and respect that. Well, listen, sir, I, I hope that you stay well and stay, stay in prayer. And please, though, consider about personally being prepared. Oh, absolutely. I have a hard life. And it carries seven pounds for 30 days of food. Okay, good. And don't forget enough water. Water is very, very important. Absolutely. Gallon per day. Okay, and that's a minimum. Minimum, correct. Okay, sir. Listen, thanks again for calling. We, we'd we like to keep ro rolling with our calls. Uh, once again, God's blessing to you, and stay in prayer. Absolutely, and thank you very much for the call, Michael, and uh, glad you're listening. All right, Dr. Rand, let's take our next call. We've got Robert in Los Angeles. You're up next. Hello, hey, Robert. Dr. Rand. Uh, Hello, Dr. Rand. sir. How can, I, how can I help yes, you? Yes, sir. Hello, gentlemen. I uh, just wanted to ask you a question, Dr. Rand, about your uh, odyssey um, on board the spacecraft you were talking about. Okay. Okay, well, uh, um, listen, first, wait, well, hold on. First, you, you've got to turn down the volume in the background because um, we're getting a bad echo. Um, I can I can hear the show behind you, so if you could turn that down, uh, then we can continue. Sure. All right. Okay, that's better. Thank uh, you. Okay, okay. I just wanted, I yes. just wanted go, to ask you ahead. about Go ahead. Go you ahead. You mentioned that you were on the spacecraft and they were extraterrestrials. I was just wondering if you had ever thought, because I also um, have seen, uh, you know, things in the sky and also had uh, some kind of contact where I saw something, and it just made me think, you know, that these these are um, <clears throat> maybe aren't alien or extraterrestrials, but they're maybe part of a, of a secret uh, human race. Like perhaps there's two human races. Maybe we're we're being controlled and manipulated by by this other race, and they they look like us and they they talk like us and everything else. But there's two human races. What do you think about that? Well, not only do I think about it, there are at least. Are you ready? Are you ready? You got. If you have a pencil and paper, write this down. Not well, only is. Not only is that what you just described is probably real, of course, but there are 87 known, different, identified extraterrestrial species-type beings that we know mm. of. Mm. That's, That's an amazing. awful lot of, of possibility, you see. And, and most of them, most of them are humanoid in one form, See, Gene Roddenberry wasn't so far off, okay? All right? Did I, yeah. did I, did uh, I answer that one? Well, definitely. Uh, but it's just uh, the whole thought that, that these, these guys, you know, they get the sun, stars, and moon, and they get to fly around in these 
cool little spacecraft, <clears throat> which I've seen. And, you know, the rest of us, the lot, the rest of the lot, we kind of just have to crawl around and on our hands and knees in misery. I, I just understand if you if you have any thoughts on the disparity between the two races. Well, I don't think it's a matter of race. I think it's a matter of circumstance. You see. Yeah. All right. Now look. Oh, this isn't that. Con this is a good question. That's a. You, you know what? Okay. Uh, right, no, yeah, it's a good. Sense. It's complicated, but I think I can. Let me nail it. All right. I don't think it's a matter of race or anything like that. We are all human. We are of one human race. Now, there may be other elements of other being type, ET type realities that do manifest within our reality streams. Okay. Now, some of us are aware of it. Most of us are not. I'm not saying it's real common, but there are those who pass among us. Okay? Good, bad, yeah. good, bad, or indifferent. And we're not talking about demons and beings. All right? Now, what I really want to do is cut through all this mystical stuff about this, that, and the other. There are extraterrestrials. There are many different types of them. They have been coming here for possibly possibly a half a billion years just flying around one evolution to the next okay mm. they probably seeded this planet in some way shape or fashion i think that all the biblical stories all play out to some form of reality i've got an old when it comes to religion and gospels and all this other stuff i always say well, if there's a smoke coming from it, there's probably some fire underneath it. And fire, in this case, I mean probably truth. You see? Uh, and also, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting, I've mm -hmm. also had uh, three, uh, three very distinct, very realistic Planet X dreams starting since I was 11 years old. I've had these oh, wow. Planet X dreams where I was out in front of my house in Canoga Park, California, uh -huh. Standing out in front of my house, looking north to the mountains, mm -hmm. um, and I saw a huge. And all these people were standing in the street. You know, and I was only 11 years old when I mm -hmm. did this dream, but it mm -hmm. was so vivid. And I was standing on the street, and we were all, and everyone was out of their houses. Everyone was standing on the street, mulling about, and and all of a sudden, everyone just turned back and looked north up to the mountains, and I saw a, a huge wall of wet water came over the tops of those mountains and started, mm. and this, everybody just freaked out and started screaming, and that was my, you know, that was one of my first Planet X dreams. Mm. And the it was similar, one, was, were the following ones similar? Yeah, the other one, uh, I was, uh, was on a, a bridge with someone, and we were trying to cross the bridge, and uh, we looked up. And, and everyone was, you could hear all the sirens and all the screaming and, and the wailing. And everyone looked up and you could see this massive planet just coming over the top of the, the taking up the whole sky. And you could see all the, the, the definitions of the, the burning volcanoes. And you could see everything on the other planet as it rolled over the top. Of the, it just went right over us. That was that was just pretty. It was just so realistic. I, you know, I how did how did dreams. it how did that dream end? Well, I was always a witness. I was always just watching, and it just suddenly would. Well, I would how did suddenly, it end? Did it just evaporate? Did it just stop? What? No. How did it, I just I just woke up. I just woke up out of my sleep. So while it was doing whatever it was doing. Yeah, I just woke up. Okay. Yeah. Did you say there was a third one? Uh, the, it was just another one. It was on the, the bridge. I was on a bridge, and and I was with this person, and we were watching it, and it was it was the planet. It was a giant planet, and there was these different colored spacecrafts and lights that were coming down out of the sky, you know, all different colored, and uh, it was it was really it was quite frightening actually. I remember being uh, frightened from all the lights coming down. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was my, I, I think this is, I think I saw the future. I think I saw a, re a reality that was yet to occur. You just may have. 
How about three different <laughs> realities? Yeah. Not just one. Yeah, I haven't written it off yet for the total dream yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we 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 fail to understand how fragile reality really is. It can change in an instant. You ever been rear-ended? Sitting yeah. there quietly minding your own business and suddenly, yeah. wham, and your reality yeah, you to, changes real quick. You go into slow motion, slow motion mode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have another question for us? Uh, well, I did wanted to make a comment about what you guys were talking earlier with uh, Sandra or Cassandra, as some people are calling her. Um, it's just too weird that it moved into over where it did at the time it did. It's just too weird. It's just, it's just, I can't believe it. It's just not possible that it was just so weird. It was set up in such a way, in such a fashion. It just seems to me completely, to be completely construed and artificial. And I knew it from the beginning. I'm 14th century Ch- Cherokee, and I go back to uh, 14th century Tennessee Cherokee Indian. And boy, my senses just perked up when I when I heard about the storm. It was and it just came so suddenly, and then all of a sudden, conveniently, botching off everything, you know, including the marathon. Um, I just don't believe it. I think it has a lot to do with the aluminum oxide they've been spraying for 40 years in the atmosphere. They do, the military's been launching these endless uh, secret uh, artificial um, electromagnetic satellites in the atmosphere. And they're saying, scientists have been saying it since the 70s, and the Russians have been doing it since the 70s. It's absolutely very realistic to make weather patterns occur and move them around wherever you want. So we need to get some people answering some questions about this, starting with Bill Gates, yeah. because apparently Bill Gates has 100 patents on weather uh, weather uh, control. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah and he's uh, uh, in Monsanto oh, has the magic seed, uh, the aluminum-resistant seed. I mean, if that's not a red flag. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's all they're all in collusion. Co- collusion. All right. Yeah. So they must be what? The one world government? Who? Well, the I Illuminati. Planet, Who? The Illuminati, and they must know about Planet X. So you think it goes all the way to the Illuminati? Yeah, yeah, and it's all centered around the champion event, Planet X, champion event. Okay. It's all about the champ. It's all about the champion event. That's what all well, you're talking about right now. I've got I've got something to add to that. I'm not trying to top it. And and I'm not saying that I fully understand everything that you said. I mean, you threw a lot out there. Yeah. Which I have to digest. Okay. Mm-hmm. However, let me say this. Uh I'm not sure this is over. I still don't think that we're going to have a huge, I don't see it. I was worried about us having a huge planetary earthquake event where we'd lose four, five, six, seven cities. I don't see that. Well, at least I don't see it now. Hmm. Okay. What I do see, what I (laughs) do see are isolated storms. If what you're saying is true, then they can also be targeted in, against the Middle East, can't they? Uh, yeah, of course. They can do whatever they want. Sure. So if they wanted to give if they wanted to give Iran fits, they could probably futz with their weather and who knows what fun and games we could be into. Yeah. Well this goes way this goes way back in time. I mean even the bu- the bubonic plague that that, just, that killed hundreds of millions in Europe, you know, at the time when their civilization started to rise up. You know, when art and science and, and social, social uh, mm-hmm. thing, uh, event technology started, they started to rise up as a civilization, you know, together. So and you the, think the, that the, was uh, deliberately manufactured and well, given to the people? There's, there's no, there's notations made by people. They saw mysterious lights and myths occur, and then a week later, boom, the bubonic plague started spreading, killing most of Europe. Hmm. You know, they, no. they, they don't, these, these, if there's two human races... And the con- our controllers aren't allowing us to have to grow. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's a, another whole that's another whole subject and train of thought there. This dual race thing. It is, and uh, 
Robert, I, I want to thank you for your call. I, a very good call, and you know I understand a lot of what he's talking about. Sure. Um, as far as harp goes, Doctor Rand, uh, I know that it's used. Um, it has something to do with uh, controlling the weather in some way. Um, I don't know exactly its capabilities. You know, I, I have a lot of speculation, just like everyone else. What I'd like is for a really good, solid whistleblower to come out on that. That goes with the chemtrails, too. Now, that I know is a fact. I know they're spraying chemicals in our skies, and uh, that's something else. We just need a good, solid whistleblower to come out, uh, not somebody who's trying to benefit and get a name for themselves, but somebody who's just trying to do the right thing and tell us what's going on, and that's what we really need. Um, but he's right. They, they have been... Uh, messing around with uh, controlling the weather for a long time now, and uh, it's not just the United States. There's other countries doing it, too. We know that Russia has mastered it. Um, matter of fact, they might have been first uh, with this technology. So uh, interesting stuff. We have another call, Dr. Rand, uh, unless you want to comment. Before Robert, we take thank it. you so much for calling. Yeah, great call. Great okay. call. Uh, All right. All right. Next up, we've got Mike in China. Mike, welcome to the United States, at least for a little while. <laughs> hey, how you doing, Michael? All right, Michael. how are you? Michael, awesome, awesome, are, awesome. Are, you, are you really in China, China? Yes, this is Mike, and uh, yeah, I'm in Shenzhen, China. It's about an hour from Hong Kong. This is an, indeed an honor having you on the show. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. It's an honor to talk to you, Dr. Rand. And I actually am in the middle of an English class here in China. So I have students here. And oh. uh, we're going to, yeah, yes. And so we're going to ask a question. And the okay, question is I'd really, love to. I'd, yeah, the I'd question love to. is really two, two. One, what race of people do you see, or is there any associated with the planet X? And when might we be able to see this? very well in China? Okay, two very, very good questions. Let's take the last one first. It is now being reported, being seen, in the southern hemisphere, up or around the tip of Argentina, looking towards the, the, the Antarctic Circle. You see? I'm giving you a general direction. Now, it should be seen within the next two, six to eight, six to nine months, I believe, throughout Asia, which would then take in China. Perfect. Now, you're probably going to need a special telescope because, or certainly have some kind of an infrared structure to your telescope because it's very faint. You'll see it. Okay. But you need definition, you see. Now, right. I'm not sure. Oh, can you give me some locate? I'm going to go I'm going to get to the other question. Where specifically can you give me a rough idea of where you are in China? China is huge. Yes, we're we're on the coast and we're in Shenzhen. If you know where Hong Kong is, we're yes. just about an hour north of Hong Kong. All right, let me ask you this. How close are you to the water? Oh, very close. Um, maybe 10 miles. 10 miles. Well, I'm close. You're too close. <laughs> too close? Yeah, just a little. Yeah, you're too close. Listen. Yeah, and nothing, you know, I've nothing been, may, listen, God forbid, God help us, there will be nothing that will happen. But if we do get a major world shaker, and it's possible, see, I'm not taking the cards off the table, everybody. I'm just saying, I'm going on the positive side. I think we're just going to have an increase in storms for the next year, year and a half. And I think we're going to avoid a major earthquake scenario. Unless, 
unless I've been noticing a trend in earthquakes going into the Middle East. Now, let's say, hypothetically, that it's nearing the end of 2014 and the Iranians are ready to go and we all know it, but we're all afraid to push the button because we know what it'll start. And all of a sudden, a huge earthquake rocks the entirety of Iran. And that's mm -hmm. that. I would find that suspicious. Would you? I would. I would <laughs> oh, find that very how suspicious. How conspiratorial <laughs> of you. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well... <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if it actually happened? Well, I don't know how funny it would be, but... Uh... <laughs> well, I meant funny by circumstance. I meant, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't being sarcastic. Well, you know, I get corrected a lot, the Dr. Rand. He'll send me a message and say, so you think that's funny, eh? <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny or facetious. I'm only saying that I know how serious all of this is. And kind sir and dear students, I, I still got to answer that second question. You're a little close for my comfort zone, but I think that the the good Lord in whichever manifestation He is there with you, He will keep you safe. Now, let me good. answer, rephrase that first question again. Not rephrase, but say it again. Okay. Uh, first question was, do we have, or what? Your, what are your thoughts? on what race of beings would be associated with Planet X? Okay. The easiest way to answer that is to go back to the Bible and a race of beings called the Anunnaki. Mm. Okay, now, these were the men, the, the, the men of giants that supposedly mated with the maidens of Earth. Mm. They did right. that. They did a no no. And that wasn't very nice. It was probably forcible. Now, hmm. they've always been associated with a planet called Nibiru. N I B I R U. Nibiru. Mm -hmm. Now, Nibiru is also in legend and in history and in archaeology believed and astronomy believed to be one of the original 12 planets in our solar system. I think we need to swing mm -hmm. into a little cosmology here, okay? Real quick, students, okay. are you up for that? I'm working on your say question. Yes. Say yes. Wow. Yes. They say yes. <laughs> All right, let's go. All right, let's jump back four and a half to five billion years ago, everybody, just in your imaginations. Way back past the dinosaurs, they hadn't even been done yet. To when there were 12 planets in our solar system, there was no asteroid belt, and there were three suns in our multi-star system. Three stars. Well, why don't I... What do you mean? I don't, I don't see any other stars. Well, first of all, we believe that there is a large blue-black giant, very it's so hot it's cold, star, several billion miles from here, which is not a lot of space. It's not a lot of space. No. Right, no tiny, but we can't see it. We believe that it controls our sun called Saul, the sun we wake up to every day. And it goes down every night. The sun doesn't really go down. The earth rotates. Um, and there was this third star, a little baby star. Well, kind of a baby star. The star was probably the size of Saturn, but 60 times its mass. So everybody follow me now. If you've got pens and papers, write words down like what mass and 60 times. This is one big Bertha. You know what that means in English? Big Bertha? Big. 
Okay. <laughs> 60 times the mass of Saturn and about its size. And it was about to become a full-fledged secondary baby star to our system. And it was thought that at some point that little star would be deployed out into the depths of the solar system to light the, the planets going back. See how brilliant the concept might have been? Mm. Now, about four and a half to five billion years ago, all the archaeology and legend and all of the mysteries of the planet suggest that a large planetary-sized foreign object came slicing through deep space right through what's known as the plane of the ecliptic of our solar system, and I'll explain what the plane of the ecliptic is. But before I do that, I want to make it clear that everything in our solar system, all the suns, I said all the suns, the moons, the, the present-day asteroid belt, all the planets, they all rotate around the sun in a counterclockwise motion. Very important, everybody. Write that down. In a opposite rotation to what we know was known as clockwise rotation, the exact opposite. Now, the sun also rotates in a counterclockwise, as do all the other sun systems and their planets and moons and asteroid belts and all of the stars in the known extent of our galaxy called the Milky Way. They all rotate. Everything inside the Milky Way itself rotates in a counterclockwise motion. Hmm. Now, why is this important? Because anything that comes through or against the accepted rotation of the Milky Way galaxy causes a lot of disturbance and problems. And that's why stars collide and you have plasma bursts. It gets very complicated. But space is not complicated. It's very black and white. You go against the flow, you got a big problem. So about four and a half to five billion years ago, a giant piece of space rock, huge, planetary size, pick a planet, came smashing through the plane of the ecliptic. Now what is that? The next time you go to an observatory or a place of astronomy, on the wall, you'll probably see a depiction of the plane of the ecliptic where you see the sun in the center and you see all the planets in their proper rotation and in their proper positioning and you'll see the asteroid belt and you'll notice that it all flows in a counterclockwise motion because four and a half to five billion years ago this piece of space junk, a planet, whatever, asteroid smashed through against the flow, against the grain of the solar system, which is counterclockwise, clockwise, which meant that whatever it hit, it hit head-on. Like, can you imagine two huge freight trains racing at each other at 100 miles an hour? Can you imagine the force of the impact? Same thing, mm. planetary objects, only it's greatly greatly exaggerated by forces such as gravity and magnetism. And I don't want to go off the deep end. I, is everybody following me? Yes. yes no sir. one's lost. So I far. haven't lost any of them. <laughs> right. No, we're here. All right. Good. Good. Now, when this object came in, there was no asteroid belt. There were 12 planets. One was called Marduk. One was called Plato, one was called Nibiru, 
and there were several others, 12 total. When this object came through, by the time it got done, it had wiped out at least three planets head-on collisions with them. And what created the present-day asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is the fact that <clears throat> it hit Marduk. Marduk was a large, extremely large, probably probably the size of of, uh, of uh, Saturn, but it was a rocky planet out on the edges edges of the solar system. It hit it, knocked it inside the solar system, and where it where it broke up and 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 came to pieces is now the present day asteroid belt. Wow. Marduk is in fact the asteroid belt, or what's left of Marduk. Other pieces of Marduk smashed into Earth, which probably caused the, the they called it the subcontinent of Pangaea. Way back four and a half to five billion years ago, there was just one huge landmass, and I mean huge. Ancients called it Pangaea. You might want to write that down and look it up. P-A-N-G-E-N-A. -E Pangaea. I-A-E-A. -A. Um, when this object came through, it hit Earth, breaking it, breaking up the the uh, landmass to what is now today the continents. It probably carved out part of the Earth that created the Moon, contrary to thoughts that the moon is synthetic it's not it's not cheese either it's real <laughs> um another piece hit mars there is a <laughs> terrible terrible scar on the southern backside low side of mars it's a big bulge half a planet size it's believed a huge piece hit mars head on you see mars venus mars and earth had life and water Venus, Earth, and Mars had forests. There were three exploratory, there were three types of experimental planets that were designed by some intelligence force that created all the other planets and put the sun in charge and then figured out that the big black-blue giant out deep in space would control the sun and everything that she controls. And then he had the little baby sun. And here's where we go back to Planet X. And here's where the story begins to come together. Because Planet X was known by a hundred destructive names through at least 900 centuries of, of human record far back as that. <clears throat> it appears that as this object came careening into the interior of, of the solar system, don't forget, it hit things on the outer, outer, outer ridges, outer edges of the solar system, worked its way forward, probably traveling something like a thousand miles a second. Can you imagine everybody traveling at a thousand miles a second? I'm very fast. Just like that. A thousand miles. Now, that's how space is. So when this object came through, hit Earth, killed Mars. Mars had a beautiful atmosphere, and it struck Venus a death blow. She was just getting ready to give birth to a to an internal kind of fusion system. It was, a, it was an experimental thing. I know it sounds way out there, guys. Just read history and go back and research. Everything I said is true. A lot of this is in my book, by the way. The Return of Planet X, everybody. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it on ebook. You can get it in soft cover. Lots of illustrations. Okay. Then, 
as it was flying towards the center of the sun, where it would have been, of course, consumed by the sun, it collided head-on with our little baby sun, the size of Saturn, but 60 times its mass, that was already beginning to, to go into fusion. And when it hit it, it hit it with such force and killing power that it killed its fusion system, turning it immediately into a smoldering, fiery mass and cast it 180 degrees out of its counterclockwise orbit into a clockwise orbit away from the solar system. It sent it out on a 3,600-year round trip, oblong, very narrow trajectory out toward the blue-black sun, which controls the sun and everything that the sun controls. And does everybody remember what happened to Apollo 13 of, of the U.S. space program? On the way, they were supposed to make a landing on the moon, and they had a, a serious malfunction. There was an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks, and it destroyed a large part of their oxygen to get back and electrical power. They had to abort the moon mission. But in order to get back to Earth, there's a reason I'm going here, is that their spacecraft, their, their space capsule, had to come up and complete its mission around the moon so that it could be slingshotted with the interaction of the moon's gravity back to Earth sending it mm. through space back to Earth like a giant rubber band would do. Well, that's what they had to do. That's what happens with the little baby sun. It's cast back out into space on its 3,600-year, very narrow, oblong trajectory. Now it's, now it's cast out in a counterclockwise motion which comes up and around. Now it's in the reverse field. And now it's going to go back to the blue-black star where it'll be sucked in and then cast out from the blue-black star to again begin its 3,600-year, sometimes more, 36 to 3,800 years, there's been records of it, trip back to the solar system. Now, what's it do? A lot. A lot. It takes 1,800 years once it leaves being slingshotted from behind the sun. See, we can't, we're just now seeing it because it's, it's still in the near glare of the sun. By the way, don't anybody, anybody do not look at the sun with your bare eyes, please. I can <laughs> constantly tell people that. You cannot see this object with your eyes. You cannot see it. You'd have to have special lenses and you'd have to have an infrared telescope to see it. It's getting closer. Right now, it's too far out there yet. And it won't be clear of our system till around the end of 2014, going into 2015. That's why I said earlier in the show, this ain't over until it's over. Hopefully, it won't get any worse than it is. But it's getting worse and worse and worse. Once again, it's not a show about doom and gloom, everybody. What just happened mm -hmm. really, ladies and gentlemen out there, that really happened to us here in the United States. The, the devastation is so great they haven't even been able to, to figure it out yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Sorry. let's talk a little bit more about Planet X. It comes back periodically. It's been coming back for billions of years. All these cataclysms, everything, it's all part of a grand program way beyond our understanding, way beyond our comprehension to control, and way beyond our spiritual content to really understand properly. There are good extraterrestrials and there are bad extraterrestrials 
just like there's good guys here and bad guys here. There's good angels, there's good angels from Scripture, and there are bad angels, Luciferian angels. Assuming, assuming you have a spiritual, religious nature about you, because I'm talking about Christian concepts. I'm not alluding mm. to any other than what I'm familiar with. Okay. Now, if there is a spirit world, we better be aware of it, because supposedly the Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit guides us, is in each and every one of us. And then we're supposed to have, I'm, you know, I'm going back, you know, into this, into the, you know, almost the Catholic thing. Oh, by the way, I'm a former Catholic from <laughs> Irish Catholic school. So I know my stuff, guys. They beat it into you. They really do, you know, with thick pointers. I can tell you from experience. Okay. If there is a Holy Spirit and if we do have a guardian angel, well, then, we better start communicating at a different level. I've actually learned how to pray again. I guess that's an admission I shouldn't say publicly, but I'm not. I'm proud of it. I've learned how to say my prayers at night, and I'm learning how to pray over my meals. You never know when the last one will be. You never know. You know, that kind of stuff. And I'm feeling a lot better about things. I'm feeling a lot more in control. I'm assuming I'm talking to the right spiritual entities and, and the good Lord because things are going okay. You know, in the midst of everything, I'm still okay. You know, not perfect. And I'm grieving for all those that are in harm's way right now. Now, Planet X. Can we do anything about it? Not really. You see... It's been coming in from deep space, approaching the sun, since about 1981, when it was first detected. It's been changing things on this planet all these years. If you care to look up the earthquake stats, I did this, by the way, in the book. I ran, I ran a series of earthquake stats, hurricane stats, solar storm stats, all these kind of things to show the reader that, yes, a lot of this is cyclical, but then again, a lot of it is extremely unpredictable. You see? You can't tell from time to time. I can tell you that we are very fortunate in that the Earth, its present position in its trajectory around the sun, being as we are now approaching the winter solstice, is that we are the furthest distance or near, nearly the furthest distance we'll ever be from this object. That's good. It's, it's enough that this object is affecting the sun, which is greatly affecting the earth. That's what all this weather instability is all about. And there may be some of this steering, but I will tell you this. These storms don't need to be steered, okay? I'm just not going to jump into that one right now, okay? Mm. I don't want to go. Okay. I we just got a break not. coming up in a few minutes, Dr. Ryan. All right. Well, then let's do this. Kids, study about Planet X. Just go up on the Internet. You'll find a thousand websites. A lot of it's not true. A lot of it is, I don't know, to sell stuff. A lot of it is true. You have to sift through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh, Clint Eastwood deal movie. <laughs> it's all out there for you to investigate, and I encourage you to do so. But do it with an open mind. You don't have to believe everything you read or uncover, but there's, well, I always say where there's smoke, there's usually a lot of fire. And if this object now becomes focalized after the election, see, I think, I think that they're waiting until after the election to announce it. And I, I can't fault that. Why do, you, why do you want to disrupt the election? You follow me? Now, yeah. me, talk, me talking about it is not like announcing it to the world. I just happen to think that we know what's coming. That's all. We've been right. We've been right. More times than we've been wrong so far, we've been right on with the book. 
Let me ask you this, Dr. Yeah. Rand. Do you think that uh, you think the current or next president will announce this? It's, I'm asking you because it's a question I get from a lot of people. And if not our president, will one of the others around the world uh, make a formal announcement of this? Well, if we're, if we're smart and we want to start assuming the lead in the world, we will step forward, we will make the announcements, we will, we will set all, all the directives up. You see, this is when they could initiate martial law, when they make the announcement, so that everybody doesn't freak out. You see? Now, that's just one scenario. I'm not suggesting that. I am not saying, predicting. I'm saying that if there is a major natural disaster, let's say there is a global earthquake and we lose a couple cities, that would be enough for them to trigger. God forbid we lose an American city. They trigger martial law. And that triggers a whole bunch of new scenarios. People are saying, yeah, and there it goes. One world government, one world currency. United Nations of America and all this other stuff that you're hearing. Now, we are in for some very perilous and very dangerous times, not only from Mother Nature, but from humanity itself. We're all out of control. Mm. Whoever's in that White House better be in control because it could suddenly get out of hand now my only thinking is that NASA can't keep covering this up forever incidentally I can't give you any names I spent last weekend with an astrophysicist astronomer who I found out was a distant cousin of mine and she works at the Haleakala Telescopic Institute in Hawaii, her astrophysics major is atmospheric conditions on all the planets. That's her specialty. They're all changing. Uh, yes. Yes. No. I'm not gonna I can, I'm not gonna give away any names or anything, but this is one bright, intelligent very attractive woman who I had the greatest respect for and I sat across from her over a cup of tea Saturday morning because we, we wound up sharing my uncle died my di my distant uncle to my aunt Helen died 91 years old well respected man they live on they live on like 150 acres with their own lake and pond and deer and and a beautiful estate and the house is probably two and a half million. Anyway, we, I was their guest there. Luther, the husband, died, leaving Aunt Helen. Aunt Helen is 82, and she's in great shape. Anyway, we were all house guests, captured for three days for the funeral and for the wake. So I got a chance to talk to her. And I sat, and I asked her point blank. I took out a copy of my book, and I laid it on the table, and I said, Have you ever heard of, has NASA ever heard of Planet X before? And she looked at me like a deer wounded, you know, wounded deer in the headlights. She said, mm -hmm. no, I've never heard of it. And I said, are you sure? I said, and then I hit her with the press release and I pointed to the book. And she goes, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm not making fun. And then I brought up the U.S. News and World Report in 1984, where, in fact, they called the same object. NASA then changes to now. Now they're calling it a brown dwarf star. It's in print in all the newspapers. And I, I showed it to her, and she goes, "Well, that's that. That's interesting too." I said, "But you've never heard of it." She said, "No, we never talk about it. We don't. I don't know anything about it." And I couldn't get near the subject again. Every time I tried to bring it up, I was diverted. I thought that was yeah. most most interesting. Mm -hmm. And then we talked early in the show about all these astronomers. I just wound up, I just emailed her a copy of this part one, Why Are They Murdering, Murdering Astronomers thing from John DiNardo, and I'm waiting to get her reaction to it. And I have that posted on my website, too, Dr. Rand. I know exactly what you're talking about. I had John yeah. DiNardo on, uh, I don't oh, know, great. several weeks ago. He was He's on a bright the program. guy. Great Very guy. Bright. Yes, Very bright is. guy. 
very bright. All mm -hmm. right. Um, uh, do we still have our children with us? Yeah, we're yes, still here. Yes, we do. Well, we Mike, do. Wow. Would you, Listen, would, did would I, you did I hang finally on answer the moment? question for you? Yeah, that was very good, and we can let it. You have other callers, Mike? Um, well, no, I don't have anybody else who wants to get on right now, but I do have to take a break. I'm well overdue yeah. on it. Well, we'll, so, go, ahead, we'll all right. go ahead and drop it. We'll go ahead and drop and listen to you guys. And uh, everybody here, say say bye, Mike, and bye. Thank you, Dr. Lund. Go ahead, loud. So my my, my pleasure. My pleasure, everybody. And just remember, <clears throat> the pursuit of knowledge is critical to your intellectual and spiritual development. So That's when we good. talk about things like we have tonight, at least take them seriously enough for you to check it out. Our website. Write this down, everybody, www.returnofplanetx.com. There's a hyphen Perfect. between the T and the X. Our website will keep you busy for several hours. I've got some great <laughs> wallpapers for your computers. I've got a science section. I've got videos. You can meet my kitty cats. I'm very <laughs> real, and, and, and I've written a book which... If you guys want to, you can get on Kindle, go through Amazon.com, or mm -hmm. write to me at my website, and we'll work something out for you guys in China, okay? Well, well, Doc, I'll, I'll email you. I'd like to get you on my show, too, Tough Reality. I'd, I'd love to. Uh, my email is skipper at att.net. Skipper, Got it. like the word, at att.net. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll good talk night, to you guys everybody. later in China. Good, good night, everybody. God bless you all. Thank you. Yeah, bye -bye. God bless bye -bye. each and every one of you. Thank you for the call, Mike. And uh, Dr. Rand, hang on there with us for a moment. We're going to get this break done. And Dr. Jason Q. Rand, and uh, his website is www.returnofplanetx.com. I believe there's a hyphen in there. He'll tell you about that. Um, his book, The Return of Planet X. Uh, he's been working on this for a very long time, and uh, he's been informing us for a very long time, and I do appreciate it. Make sure you get over to www.latenightinthemidlands.com. Become a member, be informed, but by all means, inform others. And the article he's talking about, about uh, John DiNardo, uh, I do have that posted in the latest news on latenightinthemidlands.com, so you can click there. Uh, John DiNardo sends me uh, a lot of information, and, uh, you know, I asked him if, if I had permission when he sends me this information to post it, and he told me absolutely, which I'm glad, you know, there's some people who are stubborn about that, like especially these mainstream sites. If once in a while they put something out there that you actually think is true and want to spread, they don't want you to. It's like, no, send them here. You know, it reminds me of a certain radio network that I used to be with. You know, they just want the traffic. They don't care about getting the word out and informing the people. And that's not how we roll here. Uh, we're just trying to get the truth out, uh, trying to explore uh, research and by all means expand the mind. So we bring the best guests with the best information to Late Night in the Midlands for you. And not just Late Night in the Midlands. We're like the uh, Justice League here now, I mean, with the uh, show lineups that we have, uh, just a, a tremendous amount of information comes over this network, and uh, we can continue doing that with your help. So please, by all means, if you have the means, donate to LateNightInTheMidlands.com on the right-hand side. That keeps us alive. Uh, we've been here five years, and we're going to keep uh, doing what we do as long as you continue to support us. Uh, and I thank you for that. So we're going to get back to it here because I don't want to take up too much time. Dr. Rand, my guest, Dr. Rand, we are back. And isn't that nice? Got a call from a class in China. Yes, that was that was great. That was great fun. That was great fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's good uh, to see that there's teachers, at least somewhere in the world, absolutely. Um, you know, bringing absolutely. this to the attention. And they ask such good questions. Oh, I know. All right. I know, fantastic. But uh, we've got about 20 minutes, Dr. Rand. All right. So I, I you wanna, like to take us. I want to I wanna talk about something that happened on October 12th, 2012, just okay. less, less than a month ago. Okay. Over the past, oh, I don't know, 
dozen years, there's been a huge increase of asteroid flybys. Just it's off the chart. Oh, I know. Every year, every year it's been every year it's been going up, 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 up. I mean, these are all you can check all this stuff out. Anyway, okay. we just had a near miss asteroid event, and it was called asteroid TC four. Asteroid TC four. That's what it was called. Okay. So on Friday, October twelfth. 2012, this 10-story high, 100-foot-long space rock was estimated to be 56 feet wide, 17 meters, and this huge piece of junk from space passed between the moon and the earth by only 59,000 miles, which is 95,000 kilometers. This distance, this distance is only one fourth the lunar distance from our planet. And now here, listen to this: this object was traveling in a counterclockwise motion, counterclockwise <laughs> motion. At a, it was traveling at us at four miles per second. <laughs> Four miles, or eight times the speed of a high-powered rifle bullet. I'm quoting from a press release that I'm getting ready to release. If this asteroid, TC-4, would have hit Earth, its devastation would leave a huge crater, 75 miles wide and thousands of feet deep. In other words, it would have obliterated anything for 75 miles around would take out a city like New York. It's gone. The city's gone. Just, it's rubble. Okay. Thousands of feet deep. If it hit an ocean, multiple tsunamis, hundreds of feet high, most traveling hundreds of miles per hour would race away in many directions, wreaking global havoc along their pathways around our planet. Now, I believe that this incoming outgoing brown dwarf star pushes and pulls a huge space debris field, including asteroids, smaller rocks, comets, gases, and as it revisits the solar system, and this explanation would then account for the dramatic increase of recent near-Earth misses of errant space debris, such as asteroid TC4. Now, this object was only discovered less than two weeks ago, on October 4th, and it was observed by an observatory in the Canary Islands, just off the west coast of Africa. Here's the question. If this event actually happened, which it did, why haven't we heard anything about this in the mainstream media? No, I can answer that. <laughs> Would you please? No, I go ahead. Let us have it. Well, because the mainstream media is 100% totally controlled by the yeah. elite, and they're not going to report anything that the elite do not want out there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this has been kind of a downer night for all these nasty predictions. So what I want to do is I want to take about three minutes and I want to read to you the present state of our planet on Friday night, tonight, as we are together. Okay? So everybody out there, if you kids in China are still listening, I hope you are, I want you to listen. I'm going to tell you all the things that are happening to the planet all simultaneously. I'm going to read a whole list. Understand there's not this one, this one, this one, and that one. Everything I'm reading is happening right now, all of it, simultaneously, somewhere on the planet. Okay? okay. This is very scary. Okay. 
Okay, Michael, give us give us our date. It's Friday night. Go ahead. It is Friday night. Uh, it's November second. I had to look. <laughs> okay, and what time? And what time is it there in South Carolina? I have eleven forty-two Eastern time. Okay, that's our yeah, marker that's point. That's our marker uh -huh. point. As of tonight, at this moment, Earth's calendar date is now in the fall of 2012. Okay. As such, we find our fragile blue planet world in a dire crisis. Consider these facts. One, the reality of our overpopulation, global warming and cooling, a badly depleted ozone layer, rainforest devastation, uncontrollable devastations, wildfires, hurricanes, typhoons, storms, tornadoes, mass global flooding, tsunamis and droughts, Arctic and Antarctic meltdowns, mass extinctions of multiple plant and wildlife species, widespread famines, deadly diseases are breaking out. We have outbreaks of animal and human origin, viruses, ever-increasing worldwide earthquakes and volcanic activity. Whew. All of that that I just read is all happening right now somewhere on the planet in ever-increasing volumes. Now, here's the, here's the climax point. All of which of the above are collectively taking a heavy toll on human, plant, and animal life not to mention billions upon billions of dollars in global property damage like just happened in the Northeast, lost wages, the economy, and major consumer disruptions to the everyday needs of its global citizens. What's happened in the Northeast will, is reverberating now throughout the planet in various aspects. It hit the airline industry. It hit the banking industry. It's like a ripple effect, you see. It's just the nature of our global economy. Now, Mother Nature takes no prisoners, she gives no quarter, and she remains uncontrollable. Our planet's normal 2012 weather patterns are now out of control and continue deteriorating. We just saw that with what happened in the Northeast. Now, yeah, we still have one more month to go. We No, not quite. We still have about 26 days left before the end of the uh, hurricane season. There are some things brewing that I wouldn't worry right now. However, there is another storm of another nature threatening the Northeast as we speak tonight, if you can believe that. Another very devastating storm, not from the ocean. Now... We ask, when, is, when will all this end, and why us? Well, I'm not sure when it's going to end. I've been hoping it would have ended two three years ago. Why us? Actually, we may be getting away with less than things that are going to happen in other parts of the world, you see. We haven't had a big, huge loss of life yet, thank goodness. A major earthquake, let's say in the town of Tokyo, or let's say Beijing, would kill 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 20, 50,000 people. You see? So, I'm not saying what happened to us is good, but let us consider that things could be a lot worse around the planet in the next 12 to 16 months. Whoever gets into the White House is going to have his and her and them's hands full with natural disasters. Aside from everything else, you know, the health care thing and all these issues, I'm sure they got legislation. Uh, my, my guess is that the House of Representatives probably has 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 100 bills already drafted, ready for someone's signature. That's my guess. Okay. No, probably. Now, I, I really want to say just one thing political tonight. 
There's nothing, nothing not going to gang up on anybody. The decisions you make in the next 72 hours or so are going to be critical for your personal welfare, health, and survival, as well as all of your loved ones and your pets, as well as your dollars, your savings, your automobile, and your property. It's that serious. It's winner take all. Okay? If it doesn't go the way I think most of America wants it to go, there's going to be a very difficult time, period, for everyone. If it does go the way most people, I believe, want it to go, there could be a a quick start right from that first day, and there'll probably be some obstacles. But my guess, I want to leave on a positive note, if the, will of the, luck. <laughs> prevail, if the will of the people prevail, this country will be kick-started within 90 to 120 days. You will see a complete reversal of spirit and effort and everything if the people's wishes are fulfilled. Okay? Don't stop diplomatic, Michael. Don't I get a medal for that or something? You should. I know Obama got I mean, a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Notice I didn't mention yeah. anybody's name, did I? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you know you all know what I mean by the will of the people. If it's the will of the people that it goes the other way, that's the will of the people. What are you going to do? You know, that's why we say we live in a democracy. Well, we're supposed to be in a democracy. Anyway, whatever you do Tuesday night, do it with conscience and do it with wisdom and knowledge of the issues. Do it by understanding who it is you're placing trust in and for what reasons. It's not just you, it's your family, immediate, long range, pets, canaries, fish, snakes, whatever. And what's more important is that it's your personal future. You're the one that's going to say, what did I do? Or you'll say, man, am I glad I did what I did. Because it's that important, not only for the United States of America, everybody, but for the entire freaking world, okay? Don't you think they aren't wondering what's happening? Don't you think for one minute that Yeltsin, the old former president of, uh, of course he's dead, would be turning over in his grave right now? And don't you think Putin is wondering exactly how this hammer is going to fall. We live at a very exciting time, everybody. These these are cosmic times. The cosmic clock is ticking. We are only seconds before midnight on the cosmic clock. So I think between now and the election and then 13, 14, maybe even in 15, <clears throat> could be very, very rocky, could be very well-organized. And hopefully leadership will prevail because we've got some really rocky times ahead of us. So everybody pray on it. Do the right thing and get out. Join me, Michael. Get out and what, Michael? Vote. Please. No, absolutely. I think everybody should I don't vote. care if you have to bum a ride or thumb a ride or call a cab. Please don't fail to vote. Because if you do, you're giving your vote away. Shame on you. No, I, I don't mean that nasty. But every one of us has an obligation and a right and a privilege to cast a ballot. Whomever you vote for, I'll say it that way. Just vote. And you can't come back and say, oh, man, I should have thought about that. All right? So I'm on that note, everybody, you. thanks for putting <laughs> up with us. Michael, thanks for putting up with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ren. I appreciate it.